Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So, here we are there to discuss the subject wise test series for dermatology this time. 2018, a good number of questions, 100 of them. So, yes, have you all attempted the paper? I'm sure you have, and I'm sure you got most of it correct. Let's see those questions which you haven't gotten correct, or maybe you need a little more explanation on that. So, how does this go forward? Yes, it is here. Moving on, question number one. What is this question? Read it. What is it talking about? It's talking about Murke's lines. They are seen in nails due to dash, dash and dash. Yes, how many of you know the answer? Tell me, how many of you know the answer to this one? It's a relatively simple one. It's talking about Murkane's lines. You have to know that Murkane's lines are a form of leukonychia, but an apparent leukonychia. So, let us discuss Murkane's lines in short. So, what are these lines? These lines are a form of apparent leukonychia. What is leukonychia? Leukonychia is white bands or spots on nails. Now what does apparent leukonychia means? It is fixed, doesn't grow with nail. Why? Because this is a defect of the nail bed change, not the nail plate. So, this is due to some vascular changes in the nail bed, due to which your nail appears white. This is called as your Murkane's lines. They are fixed, they do not grow with the nail and since they are on the nail bed, you press the nail, these will disappear because the entire nail bed will blanch. Right? So, these are your mucase lines. They are a form of apparent leukonychia seen due to vascular changes in the nail bed. White bands do not grow with the nail. They are fixed. Now, important is the cause. What is the cause? Cause is any cause of hypoalbuminemia. Any cause which causes hypoalbuminemia. It could be a liver disease, a kidney disease or uh, any other reason which causes a lowered concentration of serum albumin causes this hypoalbuminemia, apparent leukonychia, mucase lines. Is that clear to everyone? I have an image of this mucase lines for you. See these white bands, if such an image is given you in the exam, identify that these bands are transverse present on the nail bed. Well, you cannot make this out right like this, but if you press on the nail, the nail will blanch completely because the nail bed you press on it, it will become all white. These lines will disappear. This is apparent leukonychia, causes of which is hypoalbuminemia. So, if we move on to this question here, mucase lines are seen in nails due to? So, the answer here becomes D. Is that clear to everyone? The answer is D. Clear? Then there are some other forms uh, of uh, apparent leukonychia that you should know. These are other causes of apparent leukonychia. One is your perineal and the other is the half and half nail. You should know these two also. Very, very, very relevant questions. Very important. Very commonly asked. Terry's nail. The cause is a chronic liver disease which is cirrhosis. Half and half nail. Another C. But here the C is chronic kidney disease. So, Terry's nail. Liver cirrhosis. 
half and half nail chronic kidney disease clear to everyone can you now solve these three questions about apparent leukonychia good what else do you need to know what does darius disease show darius disease in terms of bands shows alternate red and white bands on the nails and these are actually associated with another thing which is called as v notching of the nail like this is your nail here you have this v notch and here you have these red and white bands so this is what you see in darius disease what do you see in lichen planus lichen planus the most characteristic changes a pterygium this is the most classical change most pathognomic change very commonly asked very important question apart from that what you see you see thinning of nail plate and longitudinal melanonychia so here you see black bands black colored discoloration of the nail plate so lichen planus will be longitudinal melanonychia thinning of the nail plate but most characteristic finding would be a pterygium which is irreversible loss of the nail you have to know it is irreversible that is also very commonly asked chronic arsenic poisoning does not have any specific nail change so we can skip that so moving on to this is clear to everyone this is mucase lines good moving on to the next question Powdery orange appearance is seen in which of the following skin disease? I know all of you know one important cause of powdery orange appearance, which is your inflammatory breast cancer. That is the most important cause, and that is where we have all commonly read it. But out of these four causes here, which is the most important, or where it is actually seen? This powdery orange appearance. Tell me. This will definitely be seen in those situations where there is infiltration of the skin which is compressing the lymphatics, causing lymphatic edema. Where is that seen? Hypothyroid, Graves, Hashimoto, Riedel's. I know a lot of you will be tempted to mark hypothyroid since this has a thing which is called as myxedema. But the answer to this one is the pre tibial myxedema the answer to this is pre tibial myxedema graves disease this is where you have your or pude orange appearance clear to everyone what actually happens in pre tibial myxedema there is glycosaminoglycan deposition in the dermis right since these are present in the dermis, what do they do? They compress the lymphatics, causing the appearance which is your pure D orange appearance. This is Graves disease. I have an image of this to show to you. See, you see this particular image? This is pretibial myxedema, which is found in your hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease. If you focus on this image here, right? You focus on the image here. Do you see this dot, 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 the dilated pilo orifice, the dilated hair olive orifice look like this. This is like the peel of the orange. So this is the typical appearance of pretibial myxedema, also called as pudi orange appearance. Please remember this. What are the other causes of pude orange appearance? The most common is your breast CA, which we already discussed. This is the most common cause. Other than that, you also see this in elephantiasis, which can be caused due to multiple reasons, filaria being a common one. Where else do you see this? You see in any cause of chronic edema. So chronic edema is also seen in chronic skin infections due to any cause. So chronic skin infection, a chronic abscess, a chronic uh, sinus, these elephantiasis, breast CA and pretibial myxedema. <coughs> these are all the most important causes of pudi orange appearance, very commonly asked. Please 
remember do not confuse it with myxedema of hypothyroidism this is pretibial myxedema of graves disease right clear to everyone good so we move on to the next question from here what is the next question please read what does this question offer us this question tells us that it's a male who recently visited a sea coast presented with an ulcer on the leg which is the most important cause this is not that common a question these organisms are also not very commonly causes a skin infection so you can get confused this has also been asked in an aims question this same question uh, last year in the aims what is this it is a difficult one if you know it you know it if you don't know it you really cannot even you know guess so you need to remember what is this the answer to this is c vibrio vulnificus now what is this vibrio vulnificus you must have heard of vibrio cholerae the one that causes cholera this belongs to the same genus vibrio vulnificus what is this now vibrio vulnificus a difficult question since you are not that uh, you know well versed with the other species what is this this is a gram negative motile bacterium which is present in sea water right it is present in sea water now how does it cause an infection it can cause an infection through two ways one you eat it or it inoculates onto your skin now how do you eat it you eat it when you do a raw seafood most commonly oysters and shrimps these raw seafood you eat it will go into your git go into your blood cause septicemia if it inoculates onto your skin through a wound you have a wound you go into sea water what will it do it will form an ulcer with bullae and intense necrosis in your skin right can you see this this inoculates onto the skin causes ulcer with bullae and intense necrosis so if you get a question like this particular man visited a sea uh, sea coast area he was playing in the water had a common open wound ended up with an ulcer with hemorrhagic bullae ecchymosis severe deep ulceration what is the cause the cause is vibrio vulnificus and more often than not unless and until you have a high index of suspicion you could do not diagnose it you do not start treatment for it mortality can be up to 50% even after a skin infection because from the skin also they can go into your entire body and cause septicemia very high mortality unless and until you diagnose properly important to know vibrio vulnificus what will be the treatment treatment will be doxy like cholera here also treatment will be doxy since the bacteria is vibrio only so seafood if you get a question a person ate raw oysters ended up with severe fever malaise dic what is the cause the cause is vibrio vulnificus person went to the sea coast ended up with an ulcer cause vibrio vulnificus clear to everyone important because you don't commonly read such things so the answer to the question there is vibrio vulnificus clear to everyone good should we move on to the next question yes we should read this tell me the answer what is this question talking about question is talking about a 25 year old man with something which is recurrent flexural eczema contact urticaria recurrent skin infections abdominal cramps upon taking seafood 
So what does this question tell you? It tells you that one, the patient is an adult male, two, he has flexural eczema which is recurrent, three, he has contact urticaria, four, he has seafood allergy. Right? Severe abdominal cramps and diarrhea upon taking seafood is indicative of seafood allergy. So this is what the question is telling you. And this particular thing is recurrent. Tell me what the answer is. A very, very, very easy question. They cannot make it easier than you. Easier than this. So what does this and this mean? This and this means that the person has history of A to P also. So history of A to P plus a recurrent eczema in an adult male is, what is the answer? What is the answer? Tell me. Very, very, very easy one. The answer here is atopic dermatitis. All classical features that are there in the diagnosis are present in this one. Like you have the criteria, the criteria are called as the modified Hanifin and Rajka criteria. One of that is particular eczema. Two is the typical distribution. And three is the history of A to P. These three out of four major criteria are present in this question itself. So, even if you don't know the criteria, you still know what a topic dermatitis is, you still can get back to answering this question. Very easy one, nothing difficult about it. The answer is atopic dermatitis. If it was seborrheic dermatitis, what would the question say? The question would say that the man has an eczema with yellowish, greasy, scales in typical distribution. This is what the question would have tell. Any question which is talking about seborrheic dermatitis would talk about these yellowish greasy scales. That will make it very easy. I haven't found any question on seborrheic dermatitis which does not mention this typical finding of yellow greasy scale. This is the clincher for septum. Atopic dermatitis we have already discussed. For airborne contact dermatitis, what will the question say? For ABCD, the question will say that mostly it is a farmer or someone who is working in the rural area. Then he has this rash on the exposed parts like the face, the arms, the legs. That will be the most important clincher in your question on ABCD. One, the occupation or the residence. Two, that the rash is on the exposed sides like the face, the arms and the legs. The farmers generally wear clothes where face, arms and legs are exposed. So that is what a question about ABCD will tell you. What will be pneumular dermatitis? The last option that we have here is pneumular dermatitis. What will a question with pneumular dermatitis talk about? This will talk about a coin shaped or round shaped eczema. This is just a morphological term, nothing specific about pneumonia dermatitis. This is just a morphology. You will have these round shaped lesions of eczema. This is another term for the discoid eczema. Discoid also means round or coin shaped eczema. Pneumular dermatitis also means round or coin shaped eczema. Clear to everyone? Good. So you know all the other three options also. You know the answer also. Any of these comes in your question? Good to answer that. I have some images of the typical distribution of atopic dermatitis. As you all know atopic dermatitis has three phases in terms of its distribution. One is the infantile, then comes the juvenile or the childhood form, third is the adult form. Infantile phase is in the baby, 
the point to remember is it affects scalp and face first any question which has an infant in the option there it will definitely mention that face and scalp is involved along with that since the baby starts crawling the extensors are exposed to the allergens first so along with face and scalp it is the extensors that are involved in the infantile phase of atopic dermatitis the important thing about ad is the type of distribution that varies with the age so a question having a baby will tell you that face scalp and extensors are involved images could be something like shown in here you see that the face is involved here you see that the scalp is involved this is your infantile atopic dermatitis if a question is talking about the childhood phase then in childhood phase both flexures and extensors are involved so if a question has a child with the atopic dermatitis it will say that the both flexures and extensors are involved clear to everyone this is basically a transition from the baby to the adult phase here both of these will be involved clear you can see the images here the flexures are involved here the extensors are involved both of these can be involved then comes the adult phase in adult phase it is mostly the flexures so in the infantile it was face scalp and extensor in the childhood flexure plus extensor and in the adult it is only flexure clear to everyone so this was a question which was talking about an adult with a topic dermatitis that is why it talked about flexural eczema clear good this is how an atopic dermatitis lesion looks like eczema what else do you need to remember about atopic dermatitis primary complaint is itching plus the eczema rash this is the most important so important that without itching you cannot have atopic dermatitis every question on ad will tell you that the patient has itching then what else do you need to know you need to know about the pathogenesis you have a genetic predisposition plus you have immune disorder immune problem th2 immunity is higher ige levels are higher plus you have allergens in the history so there is a history of atopy either in the patient or in the family so you can either have a personal history of atopy or a family history of atopy so you need to remember that ige levels are higher it is the th2 immunity and there are history of atopy clear apart from that what else do you need to know you need to know the criteria for diagnosis criteria for diagnosis as i already told you are the modifin hinefin and rajka criteria then you need to know the scoring scale scoring is done by an index which is called as scorad index then you need to know in the clinical i have already told you that there are three phases you know how the distribution in those three phases are then you need to know the signs that come with it three important signs that are asked in your questions one is this hatok sign second is the headlight sign and third is the antenna sign what is hatok sign this is loss of lateral one third of the eyebrows when in leprosy this is called as madrosis when in atopic dermatitis this is called as the hatok sign then what is the highlight headlight sign headlight sign is your kilitis plus 
perioral pallor. So you have lips which are red due to the inflammation and then you have whiteness around the lips. So this looks like the headlight of your car called as the headlight sign. And what is the antenna sign? This is because of the keratosis pilaris on the extensors. Now what is keratosis pilaris? Keratosis pilaris is this small bump which you have on the extensor and it has a coiled hair. So this is a coiled hair and this is a bump means a skin papule around it. So this is called as keratosis pilaris. Since the coiled hair if you see it tangentially it looks like a TV antenna that is called as the antenna sign. So these are the important questions with regards to atopic dermatitis. Treatment you should know. What is the treatment? Treatment is steroids both topical and oral. Clear to everyone? Good. Yes, so moving on to the next question. Then yes, one more thing with it. Remember the Denny Morgan folds. These are under the eye in atopic dermatitis. That solves most of the questions related to AD. You will be good with most of the questions on AD now. So yes, moving on to the next question pretty long one, read it for yourself, then we will do it together. Yes, so you have read it? Good. This is talking about an infant presented with multiple papules and exudative lesions on the face, scalp, trunk and some vesicles on the palms and soles. Mother also has history of itchy lesions. What is the most likely diagnosis? This is a very easy one. Tell me the answer to this. Very easy. A very typical question. A very easy question. Very typical question, very easy question. This is talking about an infant who has multiple lesions plus family history of itching. And the lesions here are present on body plus palms and soles. Very easy, cannot get it wrong, cannot confuse. The answer is scabies, right? What is the clincher? I am sure all of you have done it correct. I am so sure of that. Why? Because this particular line that there are vesicles on palms and soles along with the family history of itching, very, very, very typical of infantile scabies. You know scabies is such an important question. You pick up every paper, every paper that has been there in the exam, whether it be AIMS, whether it be PGI, it be NEET, there is at least one question on scabies and pediculosis. It is so important. So we read scabies here. In short, what is scabies? This is an infestation caused due to the mite. What is the name of the mite? They even ask you the name of the mite. The main name of the mite is your Sarcoptis scabii bar hominis. Right? It is a mite. How many legs? It has four legs. Sometimes they ask in pairs which is two pairs. What is the mode of transmission. The mode of transmission is through contact. 
means from one infected person to another through touch. What is the incubation period? Incubation period is 4 weeks for the first time infection. Why? Because this is actually a delayed type hypersensitivity response takes at least 4 weeks to generate. There will be a phase of exposure, then sensitization and then the disease will manifest. So, it is a type 4 hypersensitivity response, incubation period is 4 weeks for the first time infection and then it can be as early as 2 to 3 days for recurrent infections. Clear? There is a question on the name of the mite, on the number of legs, mode of transmission, incubation period, type of hypersensitivity. This is the also the reason for the itching type 4 hypersensitivity to the mind, all of these very, very important questions. Clear? Then how does it manifest? On clinical examination, depending whether it is an adult or it is an infant. In adult, the lesions will be below the neck and palms and soles are spared. In a baby, face is involved, neck is involved, palms and soles are also involved. So, every part of the body is involved in the infant. What are the typical lesions? The typical lesions are your papules. Then you will also see excoriation due to itching. But the most pathognomic lesion is a this will what tell you the diagnosis. This is the most pathognomic lesion present in the infants also same things plus they have these vesiculopustular lesions on the palms and soles. Clear? So, the baby has vesiculopustular lesions on the palms and soles. This is how you differentiate between infantile and adult scabies. So, the question generally the infantile scabies will have this particular written, written in it vesiculopustular lesions on palms and soles and the most pathognomic lesion is a burrow. What is a burrow? Burrow is the place where the mite lives in the stratum corneum. So, this is found in the stratum corneum and at any point you have only 10 to 12 mites on the body. So, the innumerable papules that you have that is due to the type 4 HS response that does not mean that I have 1 million mites on my body. I have only 10 to 12 mites on the body. The itching is due to the type 4 hypersensitivity response multiple lesions, papules and excoriations and burrows. Sight, another thing that you need to remember is the circle of Hebra. The lesions are present in the circle of Hebra. Then what is the treatment? Treatment is treatment of choice permethrin 5 percent cream. There are some other treatments like Lindane, but you have to remember that it is contraindicated in babies and those with CNS problems. Then what is the oral treatment? FDA uh, oral treatment is Iver so, ivermectin is the oral treatment, otherwise it is permethrin 5 percent applied topically. Most of the questions of scabies are through. Then there is one type that you need to know, one type is your Norwegian scabies, also called as crusted scabies. This is found in those who are immune suppressed especially HIV. What is the difference? Here you have 
millions of mites on the body because the patient is not able to generate an immune response against the mite. The mite is not killed. There are millions of mites on the body, so much so that the entire stratum condom is full of these sarcoptis KBI. And despite such a severity of the lesion, the patient doesn't have any itching. Why? Because he is not able to generate the type 4 hypersensitivity. There is no itching. So this is Norwegian scabies, very important, very commonly asked, especially in HIV. Millions of mites, no itching. And what is the treatment? Treatment you give both oral and topical. Otherwise only one is sufficient. But in Norwegian scabies, you give both oral ivermectin as well as topical permethrin. Clear to everyone? Scabies is clear. It's a very important topic. Please remember it asked every year. This is an image that I have of the lesions in the baby as described in the question. There are these vesiculopustular lesions on the palms and soles. And this finger webs, very important. In questions in adults also, they will tell you that there are lesions present in the finger webs. And they can be anything, but vesicles are only found in infants. Diagnostic is burrow that we've already read. Clear to everyone? Should we move on to the next one? Images you've seen? Good. Now we come to the next question. Tell me what does this tell you? 40 year man had multiple blisters over the trunk and the extremities. DI shows linear IgG. Very easy one. Tell me the answer. Very easy. Clincher here is the linear IgG. Clincher here is the DIF, which shows linear IgG. And then what are the lesions? The lesions are blisters on the trunk. What do both the things point towards? Tell me, what does this point towards? Points towards? The diagnosis of bullets. Typical lesion blisters means they have not mentioned erosions in the question. If they have not mentioned erosions in the question, only blisters have been said. That means it is a subepidermal blistering disorder. Why? Because in the pemphigus group, which is your intraepidermal, in the pemphigus group, the lesions tend to rupture, the bully rupture. So primarily what you see, you see erosions. So the question will mention both erosions and bully if it is talking about the intraepidermal pemphigus group of disorders. But if it is only talking about blisters, blisters means there are multiple intact bully all over the body. So if they are intact bully all over the body, means that they are stronger, they are sub -epi dermal and the distribution the distribution is trunk and extremities which means trunk lower limb the lower body is more involved lower body is more involved in your sub epidermal group of disorders while the upper body is more involved in the pemphigus group of disorders not a very important criterion to differentiate but we are just talking about what the question gives us you have to catch the hints that it is giving you so it's a man with multiple bulle over the lower body. We know that it is subepidermal group of disorder. Then the DIF gives us further idea. DIF says it is linear IgG. So linear IgG means again it is a positivity on the dermoepidermal junction. 
So if it is a positivity on the dermoepidermal junction, again it tells you that it is talking about the subepidermal group of disorders, right? Because the pemphigus group will again have fishnet IgG in the epidermis since it is in the epidermis. If it is only the dermoepidermal junction that is involved, it means it is the subepidermal group of disorders. So once we have pointed out that this is a subepidermal group of disorders, these two are out of contention. Now we are left between either bullous pemphigoid or dermatitis epitiformis. Again, clinical description in favor of bullous pemphigoid, DIF in favor of bullous pemphigoid, answer becomes C. Right? Clear to you? Nothing to not answer this. This is a very easy one, very easy one. Why is this not DH? DH will show you multiple itchy. Every time the question will talk about papillovesicular lesions. Here the lesions are papillovesicular. Plus DIF will show you granular IgA at the basement membrane. So it will be granular IgA with itchy papillovesicular lesions predominantly on the extremities. That is what dermatitis epitiformis is. This question, typical description of bullous pemphigoid. There has to be absolutely no doubt. This is an easy one. Do not go wrong with this. It is a very easy one. Just remember a few points about bullous pemphigoid. This is one of the favorites. Every year there is one question on vesicular bullous without fail. This is a subepidermal disorder. What are the antigens involved? The antigens involved are bullous pemphigoid antigen 1 and bullous pemphigoid antigen 2. What is the typical clinical? It will be generally an elderly. Mostly the question will talk about someone who is more than 50. Here it was a 40 year old man meant to confuse you. Mostly the questions will be an elderly. Then there will be bullet on erythematous or urticarial base. They will not be present on the normal skin. The base on which the bulla is present will be red. Plus there will be itching and the lesions will predominantly be on the lower body. Mucosa can be involved in one third of the patients. So this will be the typical description of a bullous pemphigoid patient. The bulla spread sign and the Nikolsky sign will be negative. So bulla spread is negative, Nikolsky is negative. This is the typical description of the lesions. I am sure you all will not have any doubt in this. Okay? Then you do the histopath. You do the skin biopsy. There it will be again a subepidermal bulla with eosinophilic infiltrate. Then you do the DIF. The DIF will be linear IgG and C3 at the dermoepidermal junction. And how do you do the treatment? It is mostly self-limiting. Other than that, you can give steroids. So this is all that you need to know about bullous pemphigoid. You cannot go wrong if you know this. You cannot go wrong. There are some other questions. Though some other questions that you need to know is that the bullous pemphigoid antigen 1 and 2, where all do you see this antigen involvement? You see this in bullous pemphigoid, then you see this in cicatricial pemphigoid and then this involvement is also seen in linear IgA 
hepatitis. This is just the common antigen which is involved. Hmm. They will give you a question, bullous pemphigoid antigen is involved in all except bullous pemphigoid, cicatricial pemphigoid, dermatitis hepatiformis, linear IgA disease. So you have to know that it is not just in BP, it can also be involved in other vesiculobulous disorders like cicatricial and linear IgA disease. Clear to everyone? Sure about now bullous pemphigoid? I hope you will not go wrong in it. I have an image of the typical description. This is how it is. You see these are multiple intact tense bullae. Important point is the tense bullae. This will also be mentioned in a lot of questions. Then you see that the skin is red on red skin. Clear? Now you do the skin biopsy. So you will see the subepidermal bullae with the neosinophilic infiltrate. How do you identify it as subepidermal? You see the level. You see what is above it. Stratum basale, spinosum, granulosum, corneum. You see that the entire epidermis is above the cleft, which means it is a subepidermal disorder. Clear? This is also how you can identify this particular thing even if you have just the histopathology image in front of you. This is a subepidermal disorder and then this is the DIF. DIF you see this linear IgA running along the dermoepidermal junction. Clear to everyone? I hope now you will not go wrong in this. Good. Next question, all of the following drugs are effective in treatment of pretariasis versicolor except, easy one, common question, give me the answer, selenium sulfide we use, ketoconazole we use, griseofulvin we don't use, plotrimazole we use, right? So the answer here becomes C, Grisio, it is not used. Why is it not used? Why? This is a superficial fungal infection caused by old name of the bacteria is Pteirosporum ovale. New name is Malassezia furfur. So it can be asked either way Malassezia furfur or Pteirosporum ovale. This is actually a commensal. It lives in the human body in this form, dimorphic fungi. So when it is a commensal, it's in the yeast form. When it is a pathogen, then it is in the hyphae form. So when it lives on the human body, it's a yeast. When it lives as a disease causing agent, then it is a hyphae. Now when does it cause pathogenicity? When it is hot and humid climate that time it causes the disease hot and humid climate so question is asked on the cause then whether it is commensal it's a dimorphic fungi predisposition all these are important hot and humid climate dimorphic fungi very very important question now what are the clinical features it causes multiple hypopigmented or hyperpigmented. Both can be seen. Hypopigmented or hyperpigmented macules with fine scaling on the upper chest and upper 
back. Scaling increases on scratching. This is called as scratch sign. Then you see it under woods lamp. It will show you pale blue fluorescence. Then you see the scales under KOH that will show you the spaghetti and meatball appearance. Very important points about Pitariasis versicolor. This is asked, this, this and this. All of these are questions. All of these are questions. Then how do you treat it? Since it is a yeast mainly, you treat it with azoles, both topical and oral. Yeah. Topical and oral. Treatment I will write here. You mainly use azoles, could be ketoconazole, itraconazole, fluconazole this is the oral then you have topical topical could be clotrimazole luliconazole even topical ketoconazole is available what are the other topical agents other topical agents are selenium sulfide and cycloperox these are the agents that you use to treated what you don't use question is generally on this turbina fin is not used resio fulvin is not used very very important question what is not used. More than what is used, you need to know what is not used. Clear? Turbinifin and griseofulvin are not used in pitariasis versicular treatment since it is primarily a yeast. They have no role in this treatment. Clear to everyone? Yes? No? This is going to solve all your questions about pitariasis versicular. Please remember it. I have some images to show to you. See, this is how it will be given in your exam. You see that the upper chest is involved here. It can of course come onto the arms, but this is mostly the seboric area that is involved. The lesions can be both hyperpigmented, hypopigmented, polycyclic, discrete as well as confluent, upper back, upper chest, pityriasis, versicolor. Then I have this KOH. You see this? spaghetti and meatball. So this is the yeast form, this is the hyphae form. So spaghetti and meatball appearance. Very very important finding. Clear to you? Good. Clear? Have you all seen it? Should I move to the next one? Good. Next question. Pretty long one and a little difficult. Please read it. Yes, have you all read it? So this is a flesh colored dome shaped nodule on the right ear lobe of an elderly man short duration past one month. 
and you have a central keratin filled crater lesion is going to regress and then it disappears so these are the important points one it is a nodule with central crater two it has appeared on the ear lobe three it has regressed and disappeared what is the diagnosis tell me what is the diagnosis would a BCC regress and disappear all of these can look like a nodule or a papule but important point what will actually clinch the diagnosis the diagnosis clinchers in this question are the central crater and the regression these are the important points which will actually get you to the diagnosis does a BCC have a central crater it has an ulcer but doesn't have a central keratin filled crater no does it regress and disappear no a seboric keratosis it's a flat brownish plaque does it regress and disappear no does actinic keratosis regress and disappear no what can regress and disappear is this keratoacanthoma this is what can regress and disappear so the answer to this is keratoacanthoma clear to everyone I have an image that will make it clearer for you see this is how the question is describing this is how the typical description in the question is it's a dome shaped nodule with central keratin filled crater then it is generally seen in the elderly could be seen in sites which are sun exposed it's a pre malignant lesion in the sense that it can progress to a squamous cell carcinoma but in most cases it regresses and disappears leaving behind a scar so this is keratoacanthoma an important question because you don't commonly read it please see the image it is asked in both image form as well as text identify the dome shaped papule and a central crater a very important differential when it comes in as an image based question you know they give you the image and ask you to identify so the important differential when it comes as an image based question is molluscum contagiosum that is also a dome shaped papule with a central umbilication but molluscum contagiosum I will write it here molluscum contagiosum is an important differential when you have it as an image based question that is also a dome shaped papule but it has a central umbilication like you look at this this nodule is like this this has a crater which is full of keratin this is keratoacanthoma a molluscum is like this just this it just has a central umbilicus like you have it on your tummy it has a central umbilicus so this is the difference this is an important differential in image based questions but you have to look at the image this will be full of keratin like you see this here yellowish brown material this will be just a tiny dot in the center so this is molluscum this is keratoacanthoma please don't confuse them in the image based ones remember it's a pre malignant lesion but in most cases it can disappear 
without any progression if it was a bcc how would a bcc be described bcc is also a dome shaped papule but it has rolled up margins these are the typical things this will be given in the question if they are describing a BCC and it will have surface telangiectasias maybe a central erosion or a ulceration and this will also be on the sun exposed sites it will be locally aggressive but no spread, no metastasis, important point and it will not regress. So a typical description of a BCC will be like this, rolled up margins is important, surface telangiectasias is important, locally aggressive is important and the fact that it does not regress. Clear to everyone? Yes? that will how a PCC be described. Clear to you all? Yes? Now, if it was a seboric keratosis, this is a benign epidermal tumor. This is generally described as a brown papule which is flattened lustreless dry looking and this will also be seen on the sun exposed sites and it will also not regress. So a typical description of seboric keratosis will be like this. It's a benign epidermal tumor, a brownish papule with a flattened stuck on appearance, lustreless, dry looking on sun exposed sites, does not regress. Clear? I am just giving you a typical description of all the other options. In case of an, another question, you should know it. Then comes the last option here, that is actinic keratosis. This is a pre-malignant lesion. It can progress to SCC. This is also seen on sun exposed sites as the name suggests actinic. Then this will be a papule or a plaque with brownish, yellow, dry, scaly. That's it. You need to remember about actinic keratosis. On histopath, histopath is important. Histopath you will see. Laws of polarity in the epidermis. Dyskeratosis, parakeratosis, important. This is asked, this is asked, and this is asked, this is asked. So, it's a very important thing you need to know. Actinic keratosis, I'll show you images, they'll come further in the paper where we have other questions. But this is just the theoretical description. You should know in case a question is just a text based question. Actinic keratosis, seboric keratosis, basal cell carcinoma and keratoacanthoma. Clear to everyone? Good. Should we move on to the next question? Yes, we should. So this is how keratoacanthoma looks like. Moving on to the next one. This.
Fitzpatrick classification of the human skin is used for? Tell me, what is the answer to this? Tell me, Fitzpatrick classification of human skin is used for, is used for this. This is a marker of sunburn sensitivity. Like what is my skin? I have a brownish skin. What is my skin going to look like? See, this is your Fitzpatrick classification. The Europeans, the Americans who are totally white versus the Negroids who are totally black. This is the scale along which you grade the skin in its tendency to sunburn. Somebody who has a totally white skin, very less melanin, you put the sun on this, they will not tan because they don't have that much melanin. So they will not tan, they will only sunburn, right? So they will not tan but they will burn. While somebody here, they will keep on tanning but they will not burn. Clear? Clear to everyone? See this, it is written here. See, epidermal melanin, this one does not have any melanin here it increases. UV phenotype, this will be very sensitive to sun. This will burn but not tan. While this one is, where do I go? Yes, this one is resistant to UV. This will keep tanning because its melanin will keep protecting the skin. It will not let it burn. And since there is so much of sunburn, it is so sensitive to sun, there will be a high risk of sun induced cancers. While here we do not have that much risk. So the Europeans and the Americans, they are so prone to melanomas and basal cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas. While in us Indians here, we fall in somewhat this category. This is where the Indians fall. Even the fairest of us will be here only. None of us will go here. So the fairest of the Indians. We do not have that much BCCs, SCCs and melanomas in our country because our melanin is protective. It will protect us against the cancers. Fitzpatrick classification important because you do not read it that commonly. Please remember if it is asked you should know that it is a grade of sun sensitivity. Fitzpatrick scale 1 to 6. Please remember. Okay? Clear to everyone? Yes, no? Yes. Good. So the answer to this question here is sunburn sensitivity. Question number 9, the answer is A. Clear? Good. Moving on to the next question. Earliest cutaneous lesion in tuberous sclerosis is? What is the earliest means? What will be the first lesion to appear. All these are found in tuberous sclerosis. This is found, this is found, this is found, this is found. But which is the earliest? This is the earliest. Ash leaf spot. This is generally present in babies also. So this is the earliest lesion to appear. All of these come later. Some at 5 years, some at 15 years and so on. But the earliest lesion which is present in the baby which will actually give you a hint that this is tuberous sclerosis is the ash leaf macule tuberous sclerosis. Then there are some things that you need to remember about tuberous sclerosis. This you all know is a genodermatosis. Defect is in TSC 1 and 2. This is found on chromosome 9. This is found on chromosome 16. So chromosome 9 and 16. 
this is inherited as autosomal dominant disorder. It is a triad of epi loa. So epi loa triad of epilepsy plus low intelligence also called as mental retardation plus adenoma sebaceum. So this is a triad of epilepsy, mental retardation and adenoma sebaceum and this is also called as bone mills disease. So you get it on the chromosomes, on the inheritance, on the triad and the other name. This is all questions about sclerosis. Clear to everyone? TSC 1, 2, 9, 16, autosomal dominant inheritance, epilepsy, Bonville disease. Clear? Good. Now, what are the clinical features? Generally, it will be a baby who has epilepsy. So, if a baby has epilepsy, you examine the skin. On the skin, you see this ash leaf macule. This is the earliest skin manifestation. Then, the other thing importantly that is asked is adenoma sebaceum. This is actually a misnomer. It is nothing related to sebaceous glands. These are actually just tumors of the blood vessel and the fibrous tissue. These are angiofibromas. They are found on the face, around the nose, as skin colored to pinkish papules. So, skin color to pink papules around the nose, on the face, adenoma, sebaceum. Then another question that you get is on Kebner's tumors or periangual fibromas in the aims. This was just given as an image based question. What will this look like? This will look like this. This is your nail. These will be just tumors which will be present like this peri angual. So, this will be the tumor. These will be skin colored growths coming from the nail fold. These are peri angual fibromas, Keenan's tumors. Very, very important. Question will be on this, this, this and this. This is very, very important. Keenan's tumors. Keenan's tumors, right? Periangual fibromas. Even the images are asked. Correct? Clear to everyone? Tuberous sclerosis, you should remember. Very, very important. Have you all seen this? Should I go ahead? Good. Then other things, what you get these shagreen patches and shagreen plaques actually. These are collagen tumors, these are collagenomas and the most common site is the back. So, they will ask you what it is, they will ask you the most common site. It is a collagenoma, it is found on the back and other things you have CNS tumors plus you have renal tumors plus pulmonary. You have tubers, astrocytomas, here you have angiomyolipomas, this is angiomyolipomas and you have the same in the lung also. This is the 
most common cause of death the CNS tumor this is the most common cause of death right clear to everyone CNS tubers astrocytomas renal AML this is not acute myeloid leukemia this is angiomyolipoma and you have pulmonary lesions also similar so you basically you have tumors growing in the entire body wherever the gene is defective is there any treatment no there is no treatment because it's a genetic disease but there is some evidence for serolimus or rapamycin this can be given orally for the renal and the pulmonary lesions and this can be used topically for the adenoma sebation this is important wrapper mycin clear to everyone tuberous sclerosis you should not go wrong tuberous sclerosis and neurofibromatosis incontinentia pigmenti xeroderma pigmentosum bloom syndrome these are all very important genodermatosis if not every year then at least every alternate year they will ask you a question on this so please 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 go thorough with these genodermatosis very important I have some images which I can show you see these are the typical adenoma sebaceum lesions as I told you skin colored to pinkish papules around the nose very very important here also around the nose they are not present at birth they come later in life start around either 5-6 years or the puberty not there at birth this is adenoma sebaceum it's actually an angiofibroma then see this are you seeing this this is the skin colored plaque on the back this is shagreen patch then you see these macules these are ash leaf macules here also these are ash leaf macules and you, you can also use woods lamp to see them clearly they will look more white in woods lamp this is also asked in the question woods lamp can be used for it can be used for, to further see like I have a baby who has epilepsy I examine the baby I'm not able to see these clearly I put a woods lamp on the baby I see them better so this is the ash leaf macule clear to everyone I don't have an image of the Keenan's tumor here but that image that I drew that's how they look like right tuberous sclerosis is done every question now you can answer about TS now we move to the next question this is the next question the configuration of lesions is called zosteriform when they look like this yes very simple question all of you know how herpes zoster looks like you know what zosteriform lesions are zosteriform lesions are the ones that follow a dermatomal distribution what does dermatomal means along the nerve so this is the zosteriform pattern clear to everyone the answer is dermatomal distribution this is the zosteriform pattern now if something is lacy or net like what is this this is the reticular pattern generally seen in your LP lacy or net like pattern if something is ring like with central darkness called the bullseye lesion where is this seen tell me this is the target lesion classically seen in classically seen in erythma multiforme correct ring like form with central darkness called as bullseye this appears like this if something is circular with central clearing then this is the typical annular lesion annular if something is grouped then it is 
hepatiform. If it is coin shaped that we already discussed it is either discoid or nimular. So you know what a reticular lesion is, a targetoid or a bullseye lesion is, then the one that follows a dermatomal pattern, circular and central clearing, grouped, coin shaped. Clear to everyone? Yes, no? Very good. These are the typical morphologies, you should know them, they are asked. Not that commonly, but it's a simple one, please remember. Clear? Should I move to the next one? Yes. Oh wow, next is also on the one that we just studied. It is oral, like in plain as the typical of a reticular lesion. Associated with which of the following infections? Tell me, which of the following tells you that the patient has a risk of like in plain as developing? Hep C, Hep B, EBV, HSV. Which of these? Hepatitis C. Oral lichen planus is associated with hepatitis C. For that, let's go and see the associations of lichen planus. This is otherwise an autoimmune disease, TH1 type. The antigen here is unknown. Generally there is no cause, but sometimes it can be associated with hep C infection, with oral, dental amalgam, which means a mercury filling and some drugs. The drugs most commonly are your ACE inhibitors, then heavy metals like arsenic, gold, thallium. So mostly the questions are with ACE inhibitors. Hep C, dental amalgam, ACE inhibitors. These are all important questions with regards to the pathogenesis of lichen planus. Clear to everyone? Yes, good. So the question here was on hepatitis C. Sometimes it is also seen more commonly in those who are diabetics. Has not yet been asked, but you should still know that it can also be seen in those who are diabetics. Clear to all? Yes, good. So the answer to this one is hepatitis C. Good. See this is how I was telling you the lacy of the reticular pattern. This is how the typical reticular pattern is that is why I have put this image to tell you that this is the reticular pattern. Clear to all? Yes. Good. We have another question coming on OLP. So I will discuss the clinical features there. This is the next one. Read this. Have you all read it? So, 
a 55 year old male uncontrolled dm uncontrolled hypertension develops severe abcd what will be the most appropriate treatment what will be the most appropriate treatment tell me As the name suggests, it's a type of contact dermatitis through airborne allergens. What is the cause of this? The cause is Parthenium Hysteroforus. It has some allergens which are caused, called as Success quitter pones. Parthenium hysterophorus, the allergens are sesquitophones, they are found in the reason of this. Generally seen in farmers or those living in rural areas, since this is a weed, also called as Congress grass. It is in farmers who are living in rural areas, generally seen in exposed areas. I already told you the face, arms and legs, it will be very itchy, right. So this is what is ABCD. Now how do you diagnose it? You diagnose it from the typical clinical features plus you do a patch test which tells you that there is Parthenium hypersensitivity. How do you treat it? You treat it, first you do cessation of the exposure means you ask the patient to change his environment, wear full sleeves, clothes and uh, remove the weeds from his farm or somewhere. Then you give corticosteroids. If it is limited, you can give them topical or you can also give oral. What is the next option? The next option is Azathioprine, excellent results in ABCD, like our patients improve dramatically once you start them with steroids, also azathioprine, azathioprine takes some time to act, so meanwhile the steroids control the disease, long term you move them to azathioprine. But if there is a patient who is an uncontrolled diabetic, uncontrolled hypertensive or he has cataract, osteoporosis, any contraindication to a systemic steroid then you do not start them on systemic steroid. What do you do? You start them on azathioprine only. So this is important. It is also a steroid sparing drug in the sense you can give it for long term maintenance or you can give it in those who have some contraindication to steroid. So in all these scenarios you give azathioprine. In our patient, there is a contraindication to steroids. He is a he is a diabetic, a hypertensive, but he has severe disease. So you cannot just give topical steroids. You have to give something oral. So when you give something oral, then you give azathioprine as the oral treatment of choice in a patient who has a contraindication to systemic steroids. Clear to everyone? Yes? Good. Moving on to the next question. This is the next question. <coughs> 